Okay, we're broadcasting at this time as well. We're already on the record. Ms. Blake, if the state has a motion, we can argue that at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state had previously asked to be heard regarding two objections that came up during the last um, panel. The state wanted to be heard prior to bringing in the next group, anticipating that we may hear the same things. Um, the two issues are that Mr. Pryor, counsel for defense, mentioned multiple times the four prosecutors. I do think that that is objectionable. I think it's outside the scope of the purpose of Vore Dyer. I think it's also um, pandering to the jury essentially and serves no purpose as far as the Vore Dyer process itself goes. So we would ask that he um, be prohibited from repeatedly referring to the four prosecutors and then himself as a lone defense counsel. In addition, uh, the other objection dealt with, uh, I think it only happened one time that I can think of but Mr. Pryor made the comment that he believed his client was not guilty. Again, I think that's inappropriate to comment on that, to comment on what his personal beliefs are with regard to that, and also would be outside of the scope of Vore Dyer and serve no purpose um, for the Vore Dyer proceedings. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blake. <clears throat> Two different motions there. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to respond first to the state's objection when you're referring to the four prosecutors. Judge, right. if you have some suggested language for me in terms of how I'm supposed to refer to them, I'll be glad to take that language. But I don't see the prejudice in referring to four prosecutors on the other side of the table. Um, if the court feels that's prejudicial, then you can, you know, if you want to tell me exactly how I'm supposed to refer to those folks, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. But I, I see that's a little... Um, I feel like the prosecutor's picking on an issue. They feel there's prejudice there. And the judge struck me out. You want me to uh, address those folks. And, uh, as far as the other issue is concerned, Judge, I'll temper my uh, response and ensure that uh, I advise uh, them in a, a less than definitive manner in terms of the other issue. All right. Well, in terms of the first motion, um, I'm not going to prohibit some mention or reference to four prosecutors. That's who's at the table. The jurors are going to see that anyway. If it is being referred to uh, unnecessarily or in a way that's irrelevant to the procedures or selecting jurors in the board our process, then the court will consider that under advisement. But I'm not going to prohibit a reference to what they're already seeing. Um, uh, it was said, it was repeatedly made, um, perhaps in a way to try to garner sympathy. It looks like it's rising to that level. I'll reconsider it and may either re raise the objection, Ms. Blake, or I may speak up and uh, advise counsel that we consider that to refrain from that reference. But in general terms, it's not going to be prohibited. In terms of the uh, statement that was probably what would be framed as uh, vouching, then Mr. Pryor would be correct that that's an improper kind of statement to vouch for your client personally or make an unqualified statement such as that. You've indicated you'll refrain from that so the state would uh, grab the objection on that and instruct that there are not be further references where you are vouching for the innocence of your client. So that will be the court's ruling on both motions. Ms. Blake, do you have any questions on that court ruling? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the defense? No, Judge. Judge, is it permissible for me not to rise with the court preferred that I rise? Uh, it's fine if you don't, Mr. Pryor. That probably helps with the audio, actually, if you just go into the microphone and remain seated. So I have no objection to you. I want to make sure I'm not being disrespectful. All right. No taken. Um, one more thing we'll put on the record before we get started with the next group. One of the jurors uh, mistakenly noted a number that's not their number on the questionnaire and we wanted to advise you of that so on the seating chart we've got juror 841 and actually the let's see so 465 is the Questionnaire, that's the number on the questionnaire, is that correct? You've got a questionnaire with the juror number 465. That is actually going to be red card juror number 841. 
So when they're in here, they should have a red card 841 that corresponds to the questionnaire with 465. Let me make a point of inquiry. Was the 465 on the five the questionnaire? Is that the number on the questionnaire, or are they actually make That is the number on the questionnaire. So the questionnaire reads 465. However, that is actually your 841. You're welcome. All right, Council. Um, took a while on that last group to the extent we can make it any more efficient or move more quickly. I do intend to get through this group today. We've been waiting since this afternoon. So we will proceed first with the court's board dial, then on to council. Uh, if everyone's ready, then we'll go ahead and have this next group of 16 brought in for board dial. So instruct the marshals to have the jurors brought in, please. For sure. Thank you. All right, please. Here you are. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for returning. Apologies for the delay this afternoon. I'm going to first, if we would do this, just to give counsel and the court an opportunity to confirm your seating arrangement that it corresponds with our chart. If you don't mind, if each of you would please just hold your red card up for a moment and give us a moment to review our charts, then we'll move on from there. <coughs> All right, thank you. Uh, first, Council, I will remind you, please only refer to jurors by their red card numbers, not by name. As I mentioned previously, we are here to select a total of 12 jurors plus six alternates for trial. So we're going to have uh, a total number of 50 prospective jurors to get to peremptory challenges. The court's going to conduct its own board dire and I'll uh, request the council not repeat questions the court's already asked. We are now broadcasting the proceedings. We are on the record on KCR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Davo. I'll note Mr. Davo is present as well as his attorney, Mr. Pryor. The state's here represented by Mr. Wood, Ms. Blake, Ms. Beatty, and Mr. Wixom. First question I'll ask of counsel beginning with the state, is there any objection to the manner in which the jury panel has been recalled and seated today? No, Your Honor, thank you. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for returning this afternoon. You've been recalled as prospective jurors in this case. Uh, in this case, I'm Stephen W. Boyce, the district judge of Fremont County, Idaho, and I'm in charge of the courtroom in this trial. Uh, my court clerk to the right is Shannon Holstein, who is keeping minutes of this proceeding and will also be administering oaths to you as jurors. We've got our courtroom marshals here, Mr. Holmes, Beige, and Ravello, who will work with keeping order in the courtroom as well as helping you as jurors move about. The court reporter, Mary Fox, is seated down to my left, and she's keeping a stenographic record of everything said in these proceedings. 
and my staff attorney Courtney Stallings is seated to the far right against the wall and she assists me with legal research and administrative issues that come up throughout the day. Each one of you is qualified to serve as a juror of this court and you filled out a questionnaire that we have now reviewed. We are going to go through this process in an effort to select 18 jurors, which will compromise 12 trial jurors and six alternates. The clerk at this time now, using the red card number, will please make a roll call of the jurors. You guys are audibly when I just remember that. Uh, juror 440? Here. Juror 465? Here. Juror 496? Here. Juror 505? Here. Juror 526? Here. Juror 536? Here. Juror 539? Here. Juror 544? Here. Juror 591? Here. Juror 617? Here. Juror 631? Here. Juror 641? Here. Juror 647? Here. Juror 653? Here. Juror 686? Here. Juror 740? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, for jurors that did not appear, the court will indicate an admonishment that they may be subject to fines or jail time under Idaho Code 7610 and Idaho Code 22085. So for those of you who did appear today in this group of 16, thank you for returning. To assist you in understanding and participating in this jury selection process. Uh, again, I'll reintroduce you to the parties and the lawyers and summarize briefly what the case is about. When I introduce an individual, please stand and briefly face the jury panel, then we'll take your seat. The case has been brought by the state of Idaho, sometimes referred to as the prosecution. The state's represented at this trial by Fremont County Prosecutor Lindsey Blake, Madison County Prosecutor Rob Wood. Specially appointed prosecutor Eva Beatty and deputy prosecutor Rocky Wixon. The defendant is Chad Guy Daybell, and he's represented by his attorney, John Pryor. This case is a criminal matter, which means the defendant has been charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of the law. I previously read to you a summary of the charges contained in the amended indictment when you were here last week to complete your questionnaires. With regard to the defendant, the state of Idaho has alleged that he committed the following crimes. Count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. Count three, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count four, first degree murder. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Count six, first degree murder. Count seven, insurance fraud. Count nine, insurance fraud. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to the charges. Please remember this is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I'll later give you to those facts. In this way, you'll decide the case. In applying the court's instructions to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is, what the law should be, or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During the course of this trial, including the jury selection process, you are instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, including by use of email, text messaging, social media, or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise. Do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet. Don't form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. 
At this time, then, I am going to request that our clerk administer an oath to the entire jury panel. Ladies and gentlemen, if you please stand and raise your right hands, I'll have the clerk administer this oath. You solemnly swear or affirm that you will truthfully answer such questions as may be asked of you by a court or counsel, touching upon your qualifications to sit as a trial juror in the cause of your own trial. So help you, God. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Our record will reflect that all jurors were placed under oath. The clerk has now paneled 16 prospective jurors for questioning in small group today. Will the state stipulate the jurors have been properly called and impaneled? Yes, Your Honor. Will the defense stipulate? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. These jurors were uh, sent home last week after completing the questionnaire and then provided an affirmation that they have not gone and researched or looked into the case between now and then, nor discussed it with anyone. Uh, let me inquire next of our bailiffs. Do we know if a juror affirmation has been completed by this group? Yes, Your Honor, and confirmed. Okay. Thank you for following the court's admonishment of not looking into the case during that intervening time period. In this part of the jury selection, then you're going to be asked questions touching on your qualifications to serve as jurors in this particular case. This part of the case is known as the voir dire examination. Voir dire is an ancient Anglo-Norman term dating back hundreds of years to origins of the common law. And in French, it simply means to speak the truth. Voir dire examination is for the purpose of determining if your decision in this case would in any way be influenced by opinions which you now hold or by some personal experience or special knowledge which you may have concerning the subject matter to be tried. The object is to obtain 12 persons who will impartially try the issues of this case upon the evidence presented in this courtroom without being influenced by any other factors. Please understand the questioning is not for the purpose of prying into your personal affairs, but only for the purpose of obtaining an impartial jury. Whenever you need to answer a question, please raise your red card number. When you're called upon to speak, identify yourself with that number. And since we're making a stenographic recording of the proceedings, please make audible verbal responses and try to avoid speaking at the same time as anyone else talking to you that way our court reporter be able to keep a clear record. If any answer to a question would be embarrassing or uncomfortable for you to answer publicly, and I will note this proceeding is being live streamed, then please let me know and we're able to discuss those issues with you in a more private setting outside of the public purview. Similarly, if your answer to any question may prejudice other prospective jurors, please let me know and we'll also discuss that issue outside of the presence of your fellow jurors. Additionally, many of you may have knowledge of this case from pretrial media coverage and publicity. Please do not discuss any specific facts or details of this case in front of the other jurors in this pool. We can discuss those matters with you individually as needed. I'll now read to you a special instruction in this case, which is as follows. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Vallo Daybell and or Alex Cox. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant in this case and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving the alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant has the presumption of innocence, and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. That concludes the court's special instruction. At this time, I would instruct the attorneys for both parties to avoid repeating any questions already asked. The attorneys do have the right, however, to direct follow-up questions to a juror regarding responses they've made to previous questions. The jury should be aware that during and following the voir dire examination, one or more of you may be challenged. Each side has challenges called for cause, which means they can ask a juror to be excused for some specific reason. In addition, each side has a certain number of what are called peremptory challenges, meaning they can ask a juror to be excused without giving a reason for that dismissal. 
If you are excused by either side, please do not feel offended or feel that your honesty or integrity has been questioned because it has not. At this time, then the court will begin with its portion of the board dialogue process, after which the attorneys for both parties will be given an opportunity to make their own inquiries. When you are being, uh, when other jurors are being asked certain questions, please pay attention because you may later be called upon to answer those same questions. Um, the first question I'll ask then relates to your jury questionnaires, which you filled out. Let me just ask the group here, are the answers given by each of you on the jury information form still true and accurate? If you would say yes, please raise your red card. Okay, everyone responded affirmatively. To the best of your knowledge, are those answers in your questionnaires also still accurate and true at this time? If yes, raise your card. Everyone said yes. Next question the court will get to is the time commitment that may be required if you are serving on this case. As you were told last week, it would be for a period of approximately eight to 10 weeks. Would that time of service create a serious hardship upon you or your family or your business or profession or occupation so as to prevent you from rendering service as a fair and impartial juror in this case. If you think that applies to you, please raise your red card. Okay, we've got two jurors, three jurors, 641, 544, and 496. Let me take those up individually with you. So starting with juror number 496. You've mentioned in your questionnaire you are out of town for work both in April and May. Could you explain a little further about those circumstances? Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a training going on to essentially it's related to work, but I'll be traveling to Arizona. All right, would you be able to have anyone else cover or would you be able to reschedule those commitments? Sure. It would, could be rescheduled, but they're committed to prior case. I've committed to them. Um, what would be the impact on you if you were required to serve as a juror in this case and missed? And, and to be clear, these are two separate trips, both planned. Is that correct? If you miss both of them, where would that leave you? I would, I would need to reschedule, which would see me and take this off the trips or reschedule. All right, I think it would be appropriate at this point for me to allow counsel to step in and ask additional questions as it relates to the hardship expressed beginning with the state. Your Honor, the state also had noted those planned trips and had intended to inquire of those today. Given that additional information and the expenses associated with that, the state would make a motion to excuse this juror for cause for hardship. Judge Austin. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. Ms. Blake, the court's considered the information provided today, including what we filled out in the questionnaire and your responses. Juror 496, the court will find that you may be excused for cause for purposes of the hardship you would endure if you were required to serve here. So you can be excused. Thank you for reporting. That concludes your jury service. Please drop off your questionnaire with the bailiff as you exit. And then in a moment, we'll take up our next juror that had a concern. All right, let's next talk to juror number 544. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of detail in your questionnaire. It said you had a wedding in Atlanta. And can you explain to the court more about when that would be? That would be April 18th to the 20th. 
And can you indicate whose wedding that would be? It's, it's my nephew. Have you made any pre-range purchases for that trip at this point? Yes, I have. I actually have um, purchased the airline ticket before I had gotten the uh, uh, summons. They're willing to move the wedding out a couple of months for you, do you think? <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to ask the state at this point if they have any questions about the purported hardship here for this tour. Your Honor, the state also had a note on this one, and we did note there was a wedding in Atlanta. We just were unclear on the dates of that. With that additional information regarding the dates and the purchased uh, airfare, the state would make a motion to excuse this juror for a cause for a hardship. All right, response from the defense. Judge Oak. All right, well, uh, juror 544, as I mentioned last year, he will be excused based on your request to not serve at this time for a hardship that would occur if you remain. Thank you for coming in, completing the questionnaires, returning today. And your jury service is completed and can be excused. Please drop your questionnaire off to the marshal on your way. Thank you. We'll next talk to juror number 641. We've got a vacation in May to visit some elderly grandparents, it looks like. Uh, juror 641, can you provide a little more detail about that? Uh, my vacation is scheduled for May 18th. I'll be there until the end of the month. Uh, I've already scheduled time off of work, which will be very hard to move. And the expense of that will total out to about 272 for the plane ticket, which I purchased in advance, and then a train ticket to visit a family friend who was recently diagnosed. And that's incorporated in the same trip? Yes, yeah. All right, as to juror 641, does the state have any additional questions? Your Honor, we also had a note here to follow up regarding that vacation in May. Again, just not a lot of information. In addition, I'd note there was an indication that there was some concern about interruption of school and work. I think given all of that, the state would make a motion to excuse juror 641 for cause for a hardship. All right, response from the defense? Okay, juror 641, uh, you are excused based on your request of a hardship. The court determines that uh, you won't be required to serve for this case. Thank you for reporting, for completing your questionnaire and returning today. Please drop that questionnaire off with the bailiff as you exit. those jurors remaining, did anyone else have a concern about the length this trial may take? All right, and understandably, it's a difficult circumstance for all of us, anyone, and we do have one more now, 539. All right, your number 539, give me a moment. All right, can you please uh, explain a little more about your family situation that you believe uh, indicates a hardship here? Um, I have two vacations planned that are each about a week long. Um, one is in May, heading 18th to 24th, 25th. And I'm also the primary caretaker for a two year old. The May. Well, both, and when is the second vacation plan? Um, June 1st through 7th. All right. Are either or both of those already pre purchased or just planned? Um, the first one is already purchased. And can you provide a little more detail about your um, commitment to child care with the two year old? Um, yeah, I'm a stay at home mom, so I'm the, I took care of him all day long, so I have to find alternate child care for him during the hours that take place. Um, and that's pretty hard to secure child care around here, like it. There's lots of waiting lists and 
in this case, there's a potential of being sequestered for some time and you would be away from the two-year-old for perhaps a week or even longer. Uh, what would occur if you were required to be sequestered? Um, that would, I mean, that'd be really hard for him and um, I'm not sure what I would do with that. My, my answer is that, um, so he has weird hours. And do you believe that would become a significant distraction for you if you were concerned about that while being sequestered? Yeah, um, just trouble back. So. All right, let me ask the state if there's any follow up on these requests for excuse for hardship. Uh, similarly, Your Honor, the state had already made notes of those two um, planned trips. Again, we didn't have details if they had been already purchased or not. And we did have the note uh, regarding her young child and that she was a stay at home mom to follow up on. Given that additional information provided by her today, the state would make a motion to excuse juror number 539 for cause for hardship. All right, Mr. Pryor. Judge, I'm going to stipulate her being excused for Okay, uh, juror 539, courts considered the stipulation of the parties as well as your request, which you did request for in your questionnaire based on those reasons already stated on the record, you may be excused. Thank you for coming in and serving and filling out your questionnaire. You can drop the copy off with the bailiff on your way out. All right, unless there's any other concerns from the jury pool, we'll move on to another subject at this time. And again, thank you for your willingness to commit uh, that amount of time in serving on this case, if you're called. The next issue we're going to discuss is pretrial publicity or your knowledge of this case. Uh, the court would note there has been extensive news coverage of the case and other uh, in in a lot of different, uh, published in a lot of different forms. The instruction I read previously and what I want is to not go into any discussion of any facts or details you know about the case at this stage because we'll talk to you individually about that so other jurors don't hear what you already know. But with that in mind, if you do have some prior knowledge of this case, and by knowledge I mean not just heard of the case, but know about it in any detail, would you please raise your red card at this time? That's a question. Yes. Can you say in, in detail, beyond what, what's been on TV or at the news? And stuff? Well, well, we'll probably talk to you about that individually. I know it's a generic term that might mean different things to different people. Some people have followed this a lot. Some people have just heard it in passing. Some haven't heard anything about it at all. So um, have you actively followed it at all? Okay, but you have heard about the case somewhat. Okay, we will uh, ask you some further questions about that individually. Anyone else who has any knowledge of the case or? Okay, uh, 505. And 740-591. Okay, uh, for you to listed your or raise your card up there on that, we are going to ask you some specific questions individually. The next topic I'll move on to relates to the subject matter of this case. Would the subject matter of this case, which involves charges filed by the state of murder, conspiracy, and insurance fraud, would that subject matter make it impossible or difficult for you to fairly and objectively evaluate the evidence in this case and render a fair and impartial verdict? All right, no jurors answered yes to that. I'll next ask some questions that may seem obvious and we've reviewed your questionnaires but they're required under Idaho law for me to make sure there's no improper 
uh, or appearance of improper relationship or connection to this case. So are any of you related by blood or marriage to the defendant or do you, you know him from any kind of business or social relationship? No affirmative answers. Do any of you have any kind of a relationship such as guardian and ward, master and servant, employer and employee, creditor and debtor, landlord and tenant, boarder or lodger between you and any of the attorneys in this case? Are any of you, and I'll no, no affirmative response there, are any of you a party in any civil action against the defendant, Mr. Davo? No one answered affirmatively. Have any of you ever brought a criminal complaint against the defendant or been accused of some crime by any of the prosecutors that are present here, including Ms. Blake, Mr. Wood, Ms. Fahey, or Mr. Wixom? No one answered affirmatively to that. Do any of you here have any kind of an attorney-client relationship or business dealing with Mr. Pryor or his law firm? No one answered affirmatively to that. Are any of you related by blood or marriage to any of the lawyers or do any of you know any of the lawyers from any professional business or social relationship? All right, no one indicates the no any of the lawyers. This next question, you could just answer yes or no. If he, if the answer is yes, we'll talk to you about this individually, but have any of you formed or expressed an unqualified opinion that the defendant is guilty or is not guilty of the offenses in this case? All right, we've got one card, number 591. We responded to that. We'll ask you more about what opinion you may have individually. Anyone else already formed some type of an opinion in reference to the defendant's guilt or innocence? Do any of you have any particular bias or prejudice either for or against Mr. Daybell as you sit here? No one answered affirmatively to that. Are there any of you who would be unwilling to follow my instructions to you as the jury as to the law that you must apply in determining this case? All right, no one said yes. Do any of you have a religious or moral position that would make it impossible for you to sit in judgment of another or to render a fair and impartial verdict? Okay, no one answered affirmatively to that. And then, are there any of you that, if selected as a juror in this case, would be unwilling or unable to render a fair and impartial verdict based upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the laws instructed by the court? No one answered affirmatively to that. A final kind of catch-all question here. Do any of you have any other reason why you cannot give this case your undivided attention and render a fair and impartial verdict. All right, we have one juror raise their card, juror 465. Uh, is that something you wish to discuss here? Or do you think that's more appropriate individually? Okay, what would be a reason you believe you couldn't give the case your undivided attention? I work nice and usually wait half round. Yeah. And I'll just tell you that with our schedule, um, even though it doesn't look like much in my experience, this will be, it, it would be very difficult, if not impossible for somebody to maintain uh, a night shift and, and do trial in the day. I don't, I don't see that as feasible. So is that something you were considering when it got to the hardship question? Yes. Okay, so you were under the thought maybe you could work in the evenings, do this in the day? Uh, it's more of if, uh... When's the usual start time? For eight thirty. That'd be like uh, waking up at three at night. And I guess the question is, would you be able 
to not do your job while this case is going for 10 weeks, because I kind of think that is what it's going to take for you to have the mental capacity to do this. Okay. Um, let's go back to that question then on <clears throat> employment for juror number. I'm sorry, could you hold your card up again? 465. I'm going to let the state inquire at this point if you read about um, employment and any potential hardship here. Your Honor, given the information provided by Juror 465, the state would make a motion to excuse him for a cause based on a hardship. Um, response from the defense, Mr. Mr. All right, and just to be clear, you are. Uh, employed at that job full time and that's your sole source of income? Yes, sir. Okay, and if you were required to essentially quit your job for the 10 week time period, would that uh, result in a financial hardship for you? Um, yes, sir. It's capability of saying what you're doing trial. Okay, I, and I guess there's been a stipulation, I just wanna be clear on that. I guess what I'm saying is likely you, you wouldn't be able to work during that time frame. So if you weren't working, in other words, if you had to quit that job to do this trial, where would that leave you? Okay. All right. Well, um, I've considered the responses also, the non-opposition motion from both parties and I would find that uh, with that in mind, your 465, I think it would be a hardship for you to be required to serve in this case given the time frame and the employment situation. So for that reason, your 465 will be excused based on a hardship. Thank you for serving and filling out your questionnaire. You can drop that questionnaire off at the bailiff as you exit. All right, I'm almost concluded with my section of Lord Dyer, but I'll go back and just re-ask that same question since we went through that with that juror, having listened to that. Do any other jurors here have a concern that they would not be able to give this case their undivided attention and render a fair and impartial verdict? All right, that will conclude the court section of Lord Dyer. For this panel, I'll turn this over now for the state. If you'd like to conduct your board dire inquiry, who will be doing that? I will. All right, Mr. Wood. Ladies and gentlemen, again, my name is Rob Wood. I represent Madison County, Idaho. Um, thank you for being here and as just as a reminder, I want the judge said, if I ask you a question and you feel like you'd rather answer it right, just let us know. We want you to be comfortable. And there's no there's no wrong answers here. How you feel is how you feel. And we need to know that um, so that this defendant and so that the state can have a fair trial. And so but juror 505, why don't they brutal? Brutal honesty, what does that mean to you? He's being very direct. Telling it like it is. Yeah. We all commit that you'll be brutally honest in, in your response, your responses with us. You'll you'll tell us how you actually feel. Church 647. Do I see some hesitation? Yeah, yeah you oh. kind of tilted your head and looked at me like maybe I, maybe not. Oh no, I have four kids. Okay, so you can be oh, honest. I, I shouldn't say honest. You can be forthright, but that's right. Okay. Um, there, there were a couple of jurors that did list a hardship. That's my just feeling back. Uh, but you didn't raise your hands uh, when we were talking about it earlier. So if it's all right, I'm just going to ask a couple of you about that. Uh, juror 686. And you know, I apologize. You're not one of the ones I was talking about. Juror 631. 
You're a medical technician, correct? And on your on your questionnaire, it said it may be a hardship for you that equipment at a specific hospital may not be maintained. Is that accurate? Possibly. I was the only technician trained on this specific equipment at the hospital. I've already spoken with them, and they were calling me in touch. Okay, so you've taken care of that, so that if you get there, someone else can. Perfect. Thank you. Juror 653. Thank you. You had mentioned on your questionnaire it could be a financial hardship for you to take the time to be on this jury. Is that still accurate? Okay, so you've been able to take care of that. Perfect. Thank you. I just want to talk to you really quick. As the, as the court mentioned, we're going to get into what you've seen on the media individually later. But just really quick, does anybody here believe everything they read online? Nobody? Nobody believes everything they read online? So we're all aware that sometimes there's information out there that's not true. Do you, do you all agree with that? And what about news on the TV? Does anybody here believe everything they hear on the news? And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that in any way to diminish the news, just sometimes facts change, right? And, and we might think one thing one day and then we learn another fact another day. Has, has everybody seen that in their, their lives? And so this is so important. Can you all commit to this court, to the state, to this defendant that what you have seen, you'll put that aside. And you'll only rely on what you learn in this court. The, the court talked briefly about the nature of this case uh, and asked if the nature of this case would preclude anyone from feeling like they, they could serve on this jury. And just to get into to follow up on that, um, this, this is a case that involves uh, the death of two minor, the deaths of two minor children and, and a mother. And you, there are going to, there's going to be some evidence, some, some autopsy photos uh, that is absolutely difficult to look at. Um, is there anybody here who feels like looking at that type of material will render them unable, unable to render a part impartial verdict, that it would sway them one way or another? 591, thank you for being honest. T tell me how you feel about that. I may get emotional <laughs> if I do, but I'm a retired school teacher and I've spent my whole life trying to keep kids safe. And that, and you know, really everybody's safe, but beyond that, I have a very vivid imagination, or I'm a very visual person, it's really more correct. So no matter what you say, I picture it already. So I'm already living in movies, you know, that, and uh, so because of that, I don't watch anything violent, I don't watch action movies or anything, because they stay with me and create uh, a lot of anxiety. So, and you know, people say, well, stop picturing it. Well, it, it's there, it just happens, and it, it has my whole life. Uh, it, it does cause me, I, I've already lost about a week of sleep over this. Well, and I noticed you, you mentioned that in your questionnaire, uh, the, what you said, the vivid. Kind of reliving of these things. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a fair characterization? Yes. I don't want to put words in I, do, I have dreams, but we do. And uh, <laughs> I, I've had counseling and things like that, and I can get a hold of them, but when it comes to violence, um, it's just, that's, I think, I don't want to say it's a character flaw because it doesn't feel like a flaw to me. It feels like it's a, a warning. And 
I'm also very intuitive, which um, I'm not saying that I would be able to intuit everything, but um, I don't know. It's like I have a different sense about me, and it, it's a causes a lot of anxiety. And I noticed you mentioned that as well in your questionnaire. So, where this comes down, uh, is this, or are you concerned that uh, this vivid looping of information, of graphic information, and, and anxiety, do you feel like that would make it uh, difficult for you to render an impartial verdict? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your honesty. I appreciate that. Uh, judge, at this time, I would ask that uh, juror 591 be excused for cause. Response from the defense. Judge, can I just do one? Yes, you may. Ma'am, I'm, I'm John Pryor. I'm representing Mr. J. Bell today. And I want to make it clear I'm, I am required to ask you questions, and I don't want you to believe that any of these questions uh, suggest that Mr. Daybell is guilty or anything like that, but if they're just questions we have to ask, uh, would that be okay with you? Um, there are going to be very graphic pictures here, and um, they're going to be disturbing to everybody, and they're going to be very, very emotional. And one of the concerns we have is that when you look at those pictures, will you immediately assign those pictures to Mr. Daybell and assume that he's guilty because of the nature and the graphic nature of those pictures? Or would you be able to, to look at those pictures and say, it's evidence? I can maybe keep it to evidence, but what my concern is, is my how I'm going to continue to try to function during. And this is going to cause you some emotional distress. Yes. With your association with children, having someone who's worked very hard to protect children your entire life, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. If you see those, it would be very difficult. Even if the court instructed you that you know you're supposed to look at these and not judge them or be inflamed or or you know, overwhelmed by those, uh, you're supposed to look at them for what they are and continue to look at all the evidence. That's going to be a difficult task for you. You say that's the case? Yes. Judge, I'll stipulate. All right. Um, Juror 591, just, I guess, a final bit of inquiry from me. Uh, I guess what I'm hearing is you think you may get upset to the point where you're not able to pull things back together and think clearly after that? Okay. And I, um, I wish it wasn't true, but I mean, it is, so. Sure. Um, different people react different ways. That's why we go through this process. Um, thank you for your candor to the court in these questionings. I do agree that for this juror with this particular trial, uh, she should be excused uh, based on that nature of the evidence that will be presented here. Um, and so for juror 591, the court is going to grant the motion to strike for cause. And we appreciate your taking the time to fill out your questionnaire and return today. Your jury service is concluded with the thanks of the court. You can drop your questionnaire with the bailiff. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. You can continue, Mr. Goodwood. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to speak to you just really briefly about the law. The, the court asked earlier if everyone would be willing to follow the instructions as given by this court. I believe every, everybody answered affirmatively, correct? Um, anybody here have a law or a rule they don't like? 
people are either grinning or pulling up there. We all probably have something, some overlap we don't like. Um, but it's important for, for both sides to receive a fair trial that we can all agree on what the law is in this court and that it is what the, the court gives to us. Uh, is there anybody who um, feels like there may be some type of situation where they would just go with their gut rather than what the court gives? Sorry. Yeah. Sure, 505. Well, and, and, and I ask because you mentioned briefly something about that in your questionnaire. And I, I'm not calling you out for it, and there's no wrong answer. You can answer that however you want. It's a, it comes from my background as a mom. If you ask to do something wrong, they would do that. Sure. I don't know what the instruction is. Okay. That's why. Okay, that clarifies that. So um, that you can commit to. What the judge gives you as the law, you will follow that law for this case. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Your Honor, I'm going to turn the, my remaining time over to this Blake. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here this afternoon. I know it's getting later afternoon and you were all here last week. So we appreciate you hanging in there with us for this process. As you've already heard a couple of times, um, we all take this very serious. We want to ensure that we select a jury that can be fair and impartial to both the state and the defendant, Chad Daybell. So that's why we go through this process. So I don't know about all of you, but I have a two-year-old that when he wakes up in the morning, if I ask him, what do you want for breakfast? It's usually cheesy eggs. And there was a very specific recipe that I'm supposed to use to make his cheesy eggs. It's eggs, milk, cheese, salt and pepper, and usually, you know, some extra cheese in there. He doesn't like me to vary that recipe. So I saw some people kind of smile and nod along. Do any of you have that experience either with children or someone else that you work with and whether it's a recipe they like you to make a certain way or something they like done a certain way? Can everyone relate to that? And your 686, I see you shaking your head. Um, what's your experience with that? Um, I've had several siblings and did several people that had children and it's very much the same. The kid wants, you know, you better know it a certain way, you make it that way without, you know, any variation. And in your experience, were you use, usually willing to go along with, with how they wanted it made? Most of the time, yeah. And were there times that you thought, man, if they just add this or if they just do it this way, it'd probably be a lot better? Yeah. And Juror 740, did you shake your head yes as well? And what's your experience with that? Uh, just at work and processes. People are set in their way. And are there times when you go along with what their ways are if it's their call to make? Yes. And so um, I know I use kids as the example, but as you're here today, and uh, Mr. Wood touched on it a little bit already, but the judge is going to give you some jury instructions. And he's going to give you verdict forms that outline what the elements are of each count. And sometimes it's easy to say, well, it would make more sense if it was this, or why don't they add this, or why don't they take this away? But could all of you commit that this is the recipe, this is the instruction that you would have to follow? Does anyone have concerns with that? Does anyone have concerns that if you thought some part of it didn't make sense, that you'd have a hard time following that? I don't see anyone shaking their head yes on that. Does anyone here have concerns? You're going to hear from a lot of witnesses in this case. Does anyone have concerns if you hear from someone that holds different religious views than you do, whether or not you would be able to give their testimony the appropriate weight and credibility you think it was due? Does that cause anyone concerns? And 
So I'm someone that while it would be smart and easy to just check the weather app in the morning, I don't. And so I'm the person that leaves home without an umbrella and then there's a rainstorm or I dress in shorts and there's a snowstorm. Uh, so I don't know, have any of you, um, if you had gone to work or if you showed up today and as you got here, the sky was starting to turn a little overcast, it's turning a little gray and you came in here and all the windows get shut and the blinds are shut while you're in here. And you go outside and you notice water on your car, you notice water all over the pavement, water on the grass, water everywhere. Would you be able to determine what had happened? And juror 653, I see you nodding and saying, yeah. And what would you determine had happened? And juror 647, would you be able to determine? Technically, I would assume that there would be, but I didn't know. But if everything was wet mm -hmm. all around. Yes. And so even though you didn't see the rain, you didn't actually see the rain clouds, you would be able to pull all of that information together to, to reach a conclusion. And so you um, may hear the term circumstantial evidence. So you may see different types of evidence in this case. Does anyone have concerns if you're only shown certain types of evidence in weighing that and giving it the weight it's due? Would anyone have concerns if you weren't shown a specific type of evidence that you thought you should see? So does anyone here watch uh, CSI? No, we don't have the CSI people. Oh, I see um, maybe a nod. Is that your... 526? More of the criminal mind. So if you weren't shown a certain type of evidence that they might show in a TV drama or something you've watched, would that cause you concern with weighing the evidence that you are shown? You feel that you could take whatever evidence is given you and give it the weight it's due and draw that conclusion? And the judge in this case, actually, let me back up. The judge has read off the charges in this case. So we have some counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and we have some charges of first degree murder. Would anyone, if you're given the instruction, so we talked about that recipe, if you're given an instruction from the judge, and one of the elements is not that we have to show what the cause of death was. So the state has the burden, but if one of the elements is not to actually show what caused the death, so instead that we had to show uh, or prove that the defendant engaged in conduct that caused the death, but we didn't have to prove the actual cause of death. Does that cause anyone concerns? Would you be able to hold the state to the burden of showing, uh, of meeting that element that a murder had occurred, but not add an additional element that isn't in the instruction? Anyone have concerns with that? And you heard the judge give an instruction earlier today regarding conspiracy, and that is conspiracy are a couple of the charges here um, that you're going to be looking at today. Does anyone here have concerns? Because you, um, if you hear evidence regarding actions of other co-conspirators, does anyone have concerns in following the court's instruction that the conspiracy would be an agreement between certain parties to commit a criminal offense, and then one of those parties doing an act in furtherance of it. Knowing that, would anyone have concerns holding one person accountable for the actions of another co-conspirator? So if the state met the burden that all the parties had formed an agreement and only one person did an act in furtherance, if you're given an instruction that says just one person has to do that act, does anyone have concerns if holding one of the other parties accountable that didn't do that act in furtherance? So, um, and again, the court will be the one to give you the final instructions, but if you're given an instruction with a conspiracy, it requires 
two or more persons to enter into some form of an agreement to commit a criminal act, and then that one of those persons commits some kind of an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. If person A didn't commit that overt act, but they were part of the agreement, would you have a hard time holding them accountable, even though it was person B that committed that overt act? And thank you for telling me you didn't understand. I should have said that. If anyone ever has any questions, please let me know. So with that additional explanation, would anyone have concerns holding person A accountable along with person B? See people shaking their heads no. Let me have just a moment. That's all the questions the state has right now. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pryor, you can conduct for dire with the group. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is John Pryor. I'm here today representing Mr. Daybell. Um, I want to start off by uh, uh, telling you a little story. And many years ago, and I told it to the other folks before you, um, I was a juror in a jury trial. And the uh, lawyer in that jury trial asked, her, is there anybody who just doesn't want to be here? And um, I smiled, and eventually I put up my hand and said, yeah, I don't want to be here. And it wasn't anything of a significant trial. It was just one of these things that I had so much going on as a student, a lot of other obligations that I just didn't feel like I could focus or do the job that was necessary. So I'm going to submit that to all of you. And then, folks, it's really important. More important than anything else, we just need to be truthful with each other. And there's no wrong or right answer. There really isn't. If, if, if you don't want to participate in something, the best thing to do is say, you know, I just don't want to do this. Because like anything else, uh, when I have um, chores around my house to do, and it's time to take the garbage out, and I don't like taking the garbage out, and I'm going to do everything I can to avoid taking the garbage out. And if it's something that you just don't feel like you want to do, you know, you would generally not put the effort into it, but you would put in something that you enjoy doing or something that you feel okay about doing. So again, is there anybody here who, and please be honest, because it's really what it's all about. There's no wrong, there's no right answer. It's what answer is in here, and that goes to each of you. I'm not gonna judge, these folks are not gonna judge, and at this point, the judge isn't gonna judge. It's a play on words, I think. So again, is there anybody here who just doesn't want to be here today? Who just doesn't want to be involved with this? And please be honest with me. Okay. Is there anybody here who um, believes that because Chad has been charged with this offense that he's guilty right now? Okay. Is there anyone who can um, affirmatively tell me that they are going to listen to the entire evidence in this case. I mean, all of the evidence. That means after the state of Idaho, these prosecutors put on their case. And after Chad and I have an opportunity to put on our case, that you're going to wait before you make a decision in this case. Can everybody promise me that? Put your cards up there. Promise me that, please. Thank you. And I'll try not to get you to exercise this too. Okay, I'll try to be patient with all of you as far as that's concerned. Um, is there anybody here who feels that they can't sit for long periods of time, that they're going to have a difficulty in, in sitting through this, whether it's medical issues, whether it's because uh, you, you tend to twitch or you tend to not be able to sit for long periods of time or you don't have the patience? Okay, and then I insert, and again, there's no wrong answer because. Same thing, if you watched occasionally, I'm not moving around because I, I don't like to sit. It makes me uncomfortable, particularly in these chairs that the state of Idaho has decided to provide for me. 
So why don't you elaborate a little bit on the fact about your situation? I don't want to feel any details, just uh, multiple. Well, if it's something that's private, I don't want to tell medical, it's um, great, things like that. I'm just... Okay, is this something that's going to cause you some pain? No, uh, just discomfort. Okay, is, it, is that discomfort something that's going to cause you to be distracted and not be able to focus as much as you really should in something as serious as this? Not usually, no. Okay, it's just something you wanted to bring to my attention? Definitely. Is there any possibility whatsoever that this is going to be a distraction in any way for you? Uh, not a distraction for me. Okay. 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 You're comfortable that you think you might be able to sit through this? Um, yeah. And if there's any doubt, again, you know, uh, there's no wrong answer. But if there's any doubt about that, please let us know. Okay. Is there anybody here who knows me? Other than these folks who are in the uh, courtroom behind me, anybody in this courtroom right now from the, these stands forward? No. Now, Ms. Blake touched on a little bit about the court's instructions. She talked about what conspiracy was and went into some detail about the fact that there has to be an agreement, then um, uh, juror uh, 536, you, you needed a little bit of a clarification. And is there anybody who can't follow the court's instruction? Yes. One of the court's instructions, and it's going to be in, the, in regards to a conspiracy, is that the prosecuting attorney is going to have to prove that there's an agreement and that this agreement has to be with the local parties who are accused to be in this conspiracy. Okay. Is there anybody here who doesn't understand what the agreement is? Juror number 526, what do you understand it? If you don't know, that's okay. We'll just we can yeah, pass the yes. 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 Yeah. Be of the same thought. Okay. Uh, if they're saying specifically, they do a certain act. Okay. Agree on something. Not, not agree something. Okay. And the juror, I'm going to reach to the back. And juror number six eighty six. How do you? Yes, yes. How do you feel about this idea of agreement? What do you, how do you apply to that? Two or more parties come to a similar plan, agree on the details of the plan or whatever the idea is. Um, and you know, the, having trouble defining an agreement, um, but both parties have a similar thought and uh, have stated that they match each other. So do they have to be, does it have to be stated? Uh, for an agreement? Um, for a direct agreement, yes. For an implied agreement, if everything else around matches, then yes. But that, and that can be argued either way. It can be argued either way. So if you don't have the people making a positive affirmation, we have some questions about that. I'm not entirely sure yeah. how to answer that. And, and that's okay. And it, it can be a confusing issue. Okay. And, and juror number 653, how do you feel about it? I didn't think there's 
there's multiple aspects. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to move on to um, juror number 647. Is it an agreement if someone is tricked into a fool? Um, no, because they weren't given all the information or the proper information. So in order to have an agreement, everybody needs to know what's going on, know the terms. Yeah. Your number six three one. What do you think about what uh, six four seven just said? I agree. Okay. Is that it? <laughs> Straight to the point, right? And your number six seventeen. I think that you don't have all the information, and you're tricked into it. It's not a Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you folks? Well, I think I'm going to pass on that judgment. You know, at this point, I think I've been passing, but I, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Council. You know, Mr. We just asked a couple questions. Uh, in the group setting here? Yeah, we, we believe there's something that should come that uh, some law has perhaps been. Maybe misapplied. Judge, can we approach, the, please? Yeah, we can approach.
Okay, at this time, we've concluded the attorneys for our questioning. The court's going to now move on to a phase of individual questioning for jurors on certain topics. And so we will start with our lowest number, 440, I believe, is that you? And we'll have the other jurors excused to the jury room while we discuss individual topics with the jurors. So if you're not juror 440, please follow the bailiff out to the jury room. We'll call you back in when we get to you. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, uh, juror number four four zero. We've got some indication in your questionnaire regarding both topics of potential, um, what we call bias. Don't take it personally. It's a question of whether or not you formed any type of an opinion based on pretrial coverage and the other issue of the potential, uh, there was some concern of hardship raised in the questionnaire also that I would permit the attorneys to ask about. So um, with this, Juror counsel, if we can begin now, we'll move on to the other topic of the death penalty opinions and views once we get through bias or hardship concerns. Uh, if the state's prepared, you can proceed with individual board dire for juror number 440. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, juror number 440, um, just I want to clarify a few things in your questionnaire to see if they're accurate, if they are going to cause any concern, or if they're not. Um, so just starting with the hardship section, um, looking at your questionnaire, and I think they've given you a copy of it for your benefit if you need it, but I'm just down on page 20. And with trial length, it had indicated um, that your stepson's high school graduation in Wisconsin is on May 24th. I wasn't sure um, from that, is that something you're planning on attending? If I could. And graduation from the military, you said he's just going to be joining. So it's not going to be a super quick graduation. Okay, just making sure. Um, so with regard to that, if you were selected to serve on the jury, that wouldn't end up causing you any concern. Knowing that that graduation was going on and you were here, would you be thinking about it? Would it create any concerns for your ability to focus on the case in the matter I have? Thank you. And then just on the other one, and I think this was with in regards to sequestration, you just indicated that you have school age children that depend on you for care. If you were to be sequestered for any amount of time in this case, would that cause you concern or hardship? Um, I would say not too much. You're pretty good. I'm not around. I give you less And I have family that live in my home. And so you think if you were to be sequestered, you'd be able to figure out the child care? Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing anything additional there. So thank you for that. And then just looking with regard to bias, and I'm looking at page 19, there's just the question, it's F actually, um, if you formed a personal opinion regarding Chad Daybell's guilt or innocence, you'd indicated yes. And then you wrote, I do have an opinion, though it has been based only by what the media has reported, which is not always accurate. Um, what exactly did that mean with regard to your opinion? 
Um, I know that not uh, media is not going to have all of the facts and what they do have to be like not accurate. Um, so just knowing that you know, I've seen the news reports and um, that has caused me to be more open, but I feel like you know, whatever the facts are presented that would change how I feel about it. And when you say that could change how you feel about it, would you be willing to share how you feel about it right now? Um, based on what I have seen that say yes, that is and knowing that the court, um, we talked about the recipe and following the court's instructions, um, knowing that the court will give you some instructions, do you feel that you would be able to follow a court instruction to set aside anything that you've seen in the media and base any verdict only on what's presented in the courtroom in the trial in this matter? I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. White. Mr. Pryor. Is that better? Okay. In terms of the, the trip to Wisconsin, are you driving or are you flying? Um, we would fly. Yeah. If, I, if my husband knows, he's going to fly. Uh, but we haven't made any type of Okay. And it's a desire and uh, it's a desire for both of you to go though. Okay. Is it going to be like all of us to go? Okay. So there really hasn't been a determination as to whether you're all going or not. Yes. But you just have a desire to go. Right. Is it going to cause you any anguish or um, cause you to mm -hmm. lack uh, the ability to focus on this uh, at a time when this graduation is going on, and you may be here as a juror in this case. Okay, well, thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate it. Um, Judge, if I could just have a moment, please. Yes. You. Um, you made a comment that you formed an opinion. Yes. And you said, however, the media has a, well, may not always represent things as they actually are, and that there could be some slant to the way the media reports things. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Uh, but at this point, you have an opinion about this case, correct? And may I ask you what that opinion is? Okay. Now, are you going to maintain that opinion and say, well, I think he's guilty and that's what your opinion is right now, correct? And, but if you see other evidence that suggests otherwise, you're open to changing her. But at the present time, as you stand before us right now, uh, you believe that Mr. Daybill is guilty and that's the opinion you're gonna go forward with unless evidence is shown to to suggest to you something different. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay, Judge, um, I'm gonna move for cause, if I could, please. All right. Um, of course, consider the responses here. Uh, based on those responses, juror number 440, I'm going to uh, sustain the challenge for cause for bias. Um, again, nothing personal or trying to find jurors that don't have a preconceived notion of guilt or innocence. Uh, just because you do, nothing wrong with that. You follow the news as many people have. And in this particular case, we're attempting to find jurors where the defendant's not improperly working against an assumption or bias someone may have. So for that reason, juror number 440, I am going to excuse and uphold the defense challenge. Thank you very much for filling out your questionnaire for your honest answers today. Thank you for taking the time to come back in and please drop your questionnaire off with the bail as you exit.
All right, let's next have your 505 return. All right, your 505 has returned for individual for the questioning. Um, I'm just briefly reviewing the questionnaire again. You do have some uh, prior connection or knowledge of one of the potential witnesses in this case. Great. I think you an additional concern, maybe some coverage you followed in the news. And so I'll let the state follow up on any additional go dire individuals for this year. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Juror 505, you mentioned you, you have met Greg and PT. Uh, what was the, uh, the nature of your, your meeting with him? Uh, so I'm, uh, I don't know how to where he works. I was kicked out at one time. Okay. Was there anything about that interaction that would cause you to get any greater or lesser weight as a so you could you could take him as a witness with a clean slate and just weigh it whatever he's saying is all the other evidence. Yeah. You mentioned that you had seen you you think a dateline. I saw a special. My wife watched the dateline, so I picked up that. Okay. Yeah, it was one of the specials. And I, I noticed that you that you thought it was that, but you weren't sure that that's what it was. Do you recall when you saw this special? Okay. And uh, do you recall that not you need to say at all that the content of that special, what it was about? Um, no, just the basic business what's that on the news that I recall. And was there anything in that special uh, that that led you to lean either way as to the potential guilt or innocence of this defendant. I don't remember it to be honest with you, so it's not very special. <laughs> okay, so you, you remember seeing it, but you don't really recall the content too much. And and you you feel like you can whatever you did see, uh, it didn't cause you to form an opinion, correct? And you feel like you could uh, you could put that out of your mind and render an impartial verdict. Um, I didn't notice it said in your uh, in your questionnaire you've had some training in forensic accounting. Yeah, I'm a certified audit examiner. Okay. I used to be uh, for the ACFE chapter seven. Okay. Um, so that without going into detail, there, there will be some evidence in this case that deals with accounting of funds at some level. Um, having that expertise you have, um, are you going to, do you think you might be kind of critiquing that accounting either way? You know, it would be hard for me to turn that off. No, I would say, but um, I, it's, a, it's another professional's thing. Okay. And so, would would you be able to look at that evidence um, 
in, in a light that it's shown and, and weigh it against all the other evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. So you, I, neither of this, this defendant or the state has to worry that um, you'll get hyper focused on on the one portion of the case. So, and I, and I always say that because I kind of do that sometimes with you know like um, so. Um, I have nothing else about bias. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor. No, nothing, Judge, thank you. All right, thank you, counsel. Um, the next matter the court will discuss with this juror then will be as it relates to your questionnaire starting page 12. We have a section in here called attitudes regarding the death penalty. Juror number 505, do you recall reading through those questions and filling out the answers for those questions in that section? Um, yes, I do. And do you still concur with or agree with the answers you provided in your questionnaire? Can I them again real quick? Yeah, go ahead and review them, and that goes on for about two pages to the end of 13. I think, yeah. Very well. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the proceedings, in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember that any penalty you consider should be considered as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. So with that in mind, knowing this is not a hypothetical set of questions, but questions about this case, you've indicated um, on your questionnaire, I'll note, um, there's a line that says, do you support or oppose the death penalty? There was not a response or check there. Is that something you intentionally passed over because you thought it was yes or no, or did you just forget to answer? I had a tough time answering the line. I mean, didn't. Okay, so you considered it. You didn't have a yes or no? Yeah. Very well. Um, you next indicated you would... Um, it says, do you feel your views on the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair your ability to view the facts impartially? You said no. You still agree with, although you have mixed feelings about it, that you would be able to view the facts impartially. Yeah. The box you circled or letter on page 13 that you circled on that bottom set of choices for what most accurately represents the way you feel. You selected choice C, which says, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions in this case. Um, do you believe that is an accurate statement of how you feel about the topic? The closest one out of those choices. Okay. Um, one final question then for the court. Do you believe that uh, you'd be in favor of the death penalty in every case where a murder has been committed? Um, yeah. Okay. Regardless of your personal thoughts then, uh, in this case, is there anything that would substantially impair your ability as a juror to perform your duty in accordance with the court's instruction, even if that meant considering the death penalty? All right, thank you for your responses. That concludes the court's inquiry on that topic. Um, the state, any questions on board art? The state doesn't have any questions regarding this issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pryor, any questions for the defense? And sir, you mentioned that um, under item number six on page 13. Well, let me know when you're there, sir. I'll be ready. Okay. You circled number C. And if I'm not mistaken, you said, well, that one's the closest to the way I feel. Would it be? I think that that is support or not, I and mean, even more towards support. Would it be fair to say that you're neutral? Yeah, probably the closest. And if, and if there was a choice between C and D that said, I am neutral <laughs> on the death penalty, would that be a fair assessment that you'd be neutral on the death penalty? That was an option. You circled. You would have circled that one. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your time, sir. Judge, I have nothing further. Okay. 
Juror 505, that concludes your individual board dire. I'll have you return to the jury room with the bailiff to wait for further instructions as we get to the other jurors this afternoon. So next to have juror 526. All right, welcome back to our number 526 for individual board I uh, The court does not see much in the way of any prior case exposure or knowledge. There is some mention of hardship that may be addressed if the state would like to inquire as to that, but we'll move on to our next topic after hardships addressed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ma'am, hi. Uh, you indicated that you offered dog boarding in your home. Is that something that you do uh, for income? Yes. And so if you were selected as a juror in this case, would a 10-week trial uh, cause you financial hardship? No. 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 There is do you have any uh, pre-existing uh, arrangements or contracts to provide that service with anybody um, that you would have to cancel or anything of that nature that would provide you hardship? Would be hardship. If I was chosen, then I would let the families know that has helped me um, that something and I'm no longer available to that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I try. It's okay. <laughs> you also indicated uh, that you have a little boy who has a birthday on June 1st. Is that correct? Yes. Is that going to be a local celebration or would it be something? Out? It's supposed to be at my house. Uh, would there be something about throwing that party or having that celebration that would create a hardship for you that would um, make it make you unable to serve on this jury. No. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no other questions at this time. No questions. All right. Thank you. The next topic then for juror 526 we're going to discuss is as it relates to the responses you provided in your questionnaire about attitudes regarding the death penalty. So that's a section within the questionnaire starting on page 12. Do you recall reading those questions and providing the answers to those questions? Yes. And are the responses you provided when you filled this out last week still accurate in the way you feel today? Yes. Okay. Um, in the first uh, response, how do you feel about the death penalty? You said, I do not believe in it. Later, on the second page 13, there were some choices there. And you said what most accurately represents the way you feel would be choice B, quote, I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts, law, and instructions in the case. So I'd like to ask if that is still the way you feel about that topic as you sit here today? Yes, it is. Okay. And understand um, here in this case, we're not just dealing with hypothetical questions now. Uh, I would advise you in this case that um, it may well be necessary for you to make a determination in this case if you serve on the jury in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. 
Um, and remember, any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So with response to that, um, you did state that although you may feel opposed to it, you would still follow the facts, law, and instructions in the case, and if required, would be willing to follow those instructions on the death penalty. Is that the way you feel as you sit here today, knowing you may serve as a juror in this case? Yes. Kind of like what you were saying earlier, the recipe that you're given. Um, it does. It is the. So, although it's something you may not be in favor of or like or agree with, if that's the law and the court tells you that is the law, you would be willing to follow an instruction in this case to follow that law? Yes. All right. Uh, that would conclude the court's for dire as to this particular juror. Um, counsel for the state, if you'd like any follow up, I'll allow that as well as the defense. I don't have any questions. I'm on it. Thank you. All right. No questions. Questions. All right. That will conclude our individual board for juror 426. Thank you for coming back and your answers. The bailiff will tell you what happens next, and we'll have juror 536 brought in. All right, Jared 536, thank you for returning for some individual questioning here. Reviewing your uh, responses, let me first ask, are all the responses to the best of your recollection still accurate that you provided in this questionnaire? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's been some indication of previous knowledge of the case and perhaps an opinion expressed by this juror regarding guilt or innocence. I don't see much in the way of a concern for potential hardship. So for the state, if you'd like to inquire as it relates to any potential bias, I'll begin there and then I'll move to the defense. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> so ma'am, do you have any other question now with you? I might reference you to some pages just to make this a bit easier. I might call your attention to page 15. <clears throat> Excuse me. My first question uh, at the bottom of page 15, you did make an indication that you learned some things about this case from local news, and you, you mentioned perhaps Dateline or some other special. So, right? Maybe, yeah. Watch a lot of this show. Okay, okay. So then I would, I would just draw your attention down to the next question. It says, I have an opinion that he was involved. That's right. Seeing Chad and Dave Bell. Can you explain that more? What did you mean by your opinion that he was involved? What do you believe as you said that? If we could mute the on table mic while we use the handheld, I think. Yes, sorry. Okay, thanks. You're my mouse, so perhaps. Sorry, ma'am, did you get that question? Um, yeah, so when when it was first in the news with the kids missing, yeah, it just seemed like a really long time went by and 
seem like there were claims of no knowledge at all, you know, or that they were with someone else or so it just seemed like there was a lot of time that passed where there was no voluntary knowledge of what was what might have happened. So I, without wanting to put words in your mouth, I, I don't. Um, is it accurate to say that you're not sure exactly what you mean if he's involved with, just that there was involvement? Is that a safe way to say it? Yeah. Now, you understand that, as Mr. Gabriel says here today, until the state completes our job and proves he's guilty, he's got the benefit of a presumption of innocence. You understand that? Yes. Yeah. When you make the comment in the questionnaire about you believe he's involved, do you think that's going to impact you? And your ability to presume his innocence until you believe he's been proven to be guilty. Now, I know that I need to go by the evidence that we are given. You're prepared to do that? Yes. Okay. I next like to uh, direct your attention that, <clears throat> excuse me, to page 19. On page 19, the very last handwritten uh, response that you made, <clears throat> it says, I can't think of any specifics to point specific involvement or specific actions. And that was in response to a question about an opinion. Did you have any other opinion about Mr. Gabriel or this case besides that you believe he was involved in some way? No. <clears throat> On the bias portion, Your Honor, I don't have any more questions for this chair, but I may have some others. Thank you. Mr. Pryor. Juror number 536. You made the comment. Made the comment that um, you um, think he was involved. Was that based on the facts that you had heard some time ago and said, you know, looking at this thing, it seems like he has some involvement in this? Would that be fair? Or is that how you feel at the present time? Um, well, I guess both. Then okay. Okay, so going into forward, if you were to be cho chosen to stay on the juror, is your mindset that he's guilty right now, and I'm going to have to prove that he's innocent? No. Okay, and that's really what I'm trying to get at. Is um, at the present time, you have information based on what some of these folks in the media have provided to you, right? Right. And you recognize that that may not have anything to do with the juror. Right. And you may recognize that uh, when media outlets and all of these TV shows that talk about this stuff, they have a tendency to sensationalize things. Yes. It's what sells. I mean, newspapers uh, take all sorts of liberties. TV shows take all sorts of liberties because they have to do that gotcha thing. Right. You recognize that. Yes. And at this point, you don't have any uh, bias or, or you haven't made a decision that Mr. Daybell is guilty at this point. Is that fair? Correct. So you would be agreeable to looking at all the evidence. That includes what the state of Idaho does and those prosecutors and what I put on before you actually make your determination of what you're going to do. Absolutely. And you will guarantee to all of us that that's the process you're going to go through. I appreciate you walking through this. And, it's, and you understand how important that is, correct? Yes. And, I, and I'm not trying to talk down or be uh, condescending in any way. I'm just trying to make sure that I, step by step, that we both recognize that it's really important that you, you look at all the evidence and hear what everybody has to say before you say, this is how I feel about this case. And, and would you be agreeable to that? Yes. Okay, Judge, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, thank you. 
All right, juror number 536. The next topic I'd like to cover with you, and I'll have some mm -hmm. questions and statements, and after that, I'll allow counsel to inquire as well. This relates to attitudes or questions regarding the death penalty, and that's what begins on page 12 of the questionnaire. Do you recall reading those questions and considering and thinking about your thoughts on the death penalty? Yes. Are the responses that you provided still the way you feel and accurate today? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I stated early in the proceedings, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty in this case. So remember also, any penalty we're considering or discussing here in this case should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So with that in mind, you've made responses that um, on part B you say, do you support or oppose it? You indicated you oppose it, is that correct? Yeah. And when given just that yes or no answer, okay. You next indicated in the next two questions, that would not impair your ability to view the facts impartially. Do you still agree with that? I do. And you still agree with that would not impair in your ability to return a guilty ver verdict if the state had proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look over to page 13, when you were given your choices, on um, pre-written summaries of what you think most accurately represents the way you feel. You selected choice D, which reads, I'm generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case. Do you still think that would accurately represent your feelings about the death penalty? Yes. Okay. So knowing here you may potentially serve in a case where that is something you would have to consider as a juror, let me ask you uh, to confirm, would you be willing to follow the court's instructions on the law, even if you may have some opposition to the death penalty and follow any instructions given to you, even if it required you to consider that in this case? Yes. All right, that will conclude the court's questions as it relates to that particular topic. Moving on to the state, any questions from the state on that? Yes, just a couple, Judge. <clears throat> Ma'am, um, I don't recall the court specifically asked this question, but on page 12 from your questionnaire, the first question about the death penalty, you were asked, how do you feel about it? Your response was that fiscally, it seems like it tends to waste money with bills. Um, can you first explain your perspective on that? What do you mean by that? Um, it just seems like there's a lot of money wasted um, and it, with the appeals and everything, it just goes on and on. So, you know, life, life in prison is, a lot of times what they usually end up serving anyway. So there's just a lot of money spent there. So is it accurate to say that with that statement, do you feel like a death penalty imposition wastes money because of the appellate process? The Is that what you were trying to say or not? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, that's what I mean. So then if that's a feeling that you have, and again, we are just asking you to be really honest. Um, would that feeling have any influence on you when you are listening to the facts of the case and then after the verdict and you're asked to consider the death penalty? Well, that feeling that that imposition of the death penalty is largely can be a waste of money, would that influence your willingness to decide to impose it or not? No, because it's the law here. Okay. 
Your Honor, if I may, I had missed one bias statement. May I go back to that topic? It was just one statement. Go ahead. Thank you. Ma'am, I do want to go back to the issue of potential bias. On page 15 of your questionnaire, <clears throat> there's a question number five. It says, could you, your knowledge of Chad cause you to give either greater or lesser weight to these statements by me? You said yes. Then in your explanation, you wrote, since it seems like he's been untruthful, I would not necessarily believe all statements. In what way have you come to believe that he's been untruthful? What do you mean by that? Well, I guess first of all, I want to say that I don't necessarily believe everything anyone says. Um, so, yeah, to have the amount of time, like I said before, that it was in the news, you know, where are the kids? And I'm, I'm assuming that there was some untruth, <laughs> untruthfulness going on during that time. But yeah, I don't know for a fact. Okay. I'm, well, thank you. I'll just leave it with the, the last question. And so that, that feeling that, that or assumption that he was in some way untruthful, is that something that you can set aside and still give you the presumption of innocence until we can prove yeah. that he's guilty? Yeah, but I, I won't necessarily believe every statement that he makes just because he says the words. So is it fair to say that you maybe have a, a bias as to his his credibility, if he were to take the stand and testify, is that what you're saying? And I'll remind you, the judge will likely instruct you that you don't have to believe all of anybody's testimony or none of anybody's testimony. It's entirely up to each juror to decide what portion of any witness's testimony they choose to believe. So with, with that understanding, do you feel like this assumption that he's been untruthful is going to cause you to be unwilling or unable to presume that he's innocent? No, I will look at the evidence that would support either way. Innocence or not. Thank you. I don't have any more questions, ma'am. All right, thank you. Mr. Pryor, uh, either on any follow-up to that bias topic to help commit, as well as any questions you have regarding the court's questions on the government. Okay. And, and ma'am, part of your job, you understand, is to is to not just look at Mr. Daybell as, a, as anything he may have said, but you're also going to be looking at every single witness. You're going to be looking at police officers. You're going to be looking at witnesses. You're going to be looking at experts. And part of the process is to determine who you believe and what you believe. You agree with that, right? Yeah. And part of that is, is statements made by Mr. Daybell or anybody else. You, part of your job is to evaluate and say, listen, I believe this, I don't believe this. And, and, and if you're being a, doing the job of a juror, as you, you know, seem to be suggesting you will, uh, that, that analysis will go on throughout the trial and you making a determination who, who, what, where, when you believe. Would that be fair? Yes. And then lastly, um, your comment about um, death penalty, and this is at the bottom of number 12. And this is going to promise this is going to be my last question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I promise. Yeah. Um, you said, do you feel the death penalty is used and you check too often? Okay. Uh, yeah. And then you wrote in there, between the fiscal reasoning above, mistakes also happen. So this isn't saying that you are um, going to vote automatically against the death penalty, but in general, you're leaning that, you know what, I've got to be fair and, and look at both sides before I really make a, a fair assessment of this. Would that be a fair statement? Um, yes. Okay. All right. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Of course. Nothing else, James. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Council. That will conclude the individual voir dire for juror number 536. Thank you for answering those questions. We'll have you return with the bailiff to the jury room.
await some further instructions before you release today. And thank you for your patience. Juror number 617, we'll talk to you next.
Your Honor, the state has no follow-up questions, but would move to excuse this rule. All right. Which is done with the process of the rule. Sorry, I was confused. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Flay, please repeat, and then I'll go on to Mr. Pryor's position. Your Honor, based on the juror's response that he unequivocally could not uh, impose the death penalty, if it came down to that, the state would move to have this juror removed for cause. All right, there's been a challenge here. Mr. Pryor wants to respond, so you may inquire on uh, Board Dyer if there's any reason to replace him. But yes, may I just use some legal terms? Yes. Can I, can I ask an issue to stand up? We did so much this morning. If you'd can like, I yeah. The you may approach the podium, just make sure you use the microphone. And juror number 627, I want to clarify something. If you were chosen as a juror in this case, and then the judge gave you an instruction that said you were to consider either life imprisonment as an option or the death penalty as an option, would you follow the court's decision to agree to consider both of those? Yeah. And let me finish my, my comment on that. Um, there are, would it be fair to say there's are circumstances that you would consider the death penalty to be appropriate. Could I give you an example? Would you mind talking about that a little bit with me? Okay. Um, it sounds like when you made mention that, that you think that it's, it's a high honor to serve on a jury and it's our obligation as citizens. Is, would you agree with me in that regard? <clears throat> and as a high honor, it's also part of our laws of our country to protect our country. Our president's job is to protect our country. So there are very brave military and our police officers and all of the folks that are involved in the tactics of law enforcement. If we were attacked in a foreign country and they started engaging in genocide, do you understand what genocide is? Yes. And they started killing people needlessly. And at some point there was some sort of um, trial. And it's an egregious act. Children, young people murdered on the streets. Horrendous acts of violence against people and our citizens in this country. And at that point, we have to make a decision. And the options are to consider the death penalty. If it means we have to take actions in order in the future to protect our country, is that a situation where you would consider even consider um, make, you know, voting to uh, impose the death penalty on a situation like that. The only result I can see is life imprisonment. It's too high a risk. And I have many people years and many years of my tears. And once I became a member of the Catholic Church, and my folks said, If I die by another person's hand in a violent act, my family is not to let the prosecutor pursue the death penalty. I, I, I understand, and I don't want to be, you know, but you know, when I think I'm a loyal American, I would defend this country. I would do all stuff, but I just, it's different than a war, you know, you taking somebody's life. I, I don't feel it's right. I don't. I don't feel it's justice. I, I feel it's revenge. It's. It's. A, I'm sorry. I no. I will not. I and, can't not vote for the death. And sir, there's no apology needed because you know what? Um, I think I spoke with all of you folks earlier and said there's no right or wrong answer here. It's what each of us individually believe in our hearts. So there's no need to apologize because what you believe, what we're trying to establish is. And, and my questioning was not to get you to change your mind. That's not what my intent is here, sir. What I'm trying to do is find out whether there is a very narrow exception that says, yes, there are exceptions where I would consider the death penalty. They would be very narrow, but I'm not absolute. I, I've got some situations where I would consider that. But I think you've answered my question. And I appreciate your candor, and I appreciate everything. And I'm not trying to disparage you in any way. 
as I stated to all the other gurus, there is no right or wrong answer. It's what each of us honestly believe and we can tell the court what we believe in. And I want to thank you for your honesty. Thank you, sir. All right, the court has considered the motion to strike as to this particular juror, juror number 617, the juror stating unequivocally they would be unable because of personal views and beliefs to follow or unwilling to follow an instruction if it involved imposition of the death penalty. The court finds there is cause to strike juror 617. Uh, thank you so much for your candor in expressing your opinions on that issue. You can be excused with the sincere thanks of the court for your service today and for last week filling out the questionnaire. And we will go ahead and discuss this with another juror. And you can be excused. Please drop the questionnaire off with the bailiff. Juror number 631. All right, thanks for returning juror number 631 uh, for individual or dire counsel. There's a bit of a expression of concern on hardship and there was a request for hardship excuse. Uh, let me just start off by asking for a little more detail. You stated maintenance of medical equipment at a hospital. Um, can you explain how that issue would be addressed by you if it's still a concern? Uh, I'm, I was the only technician in the hospital who worked on uh, MC machines. I've spoken with management about that. They would call it outside person if I do this question. Okay, so you no longer have a concern about a possible hardship if you're required to serve in this case? No. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Council, I don't see any other uh, grounds of inquiry in terms of bias or. Uh, hardship, so I would propose we move on to the next topic. Does the state agree? Your Honor, if I just ask one question. Go ahead, Mr. Juror 631, would, uh, would this pose any type of financial hardship? No. Okay. My company pays for it. That's it. All right. Any questions? Judge. All right. So the next topic the court wants to discuss with you then, Juror 631, is in relation to your attitudes regarding the death penalty. Um, you filled out a section in your questionnaire starting on page 12 there and advised us of your views on the subject. Are the responses you made there still accurate in the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes, I just feel. Okay. Uh, let me advise you in this case, um, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And when you're thinking about that, you should consider that it would be done as if it's absolute and would be carried out in the case if that was your decision. So with that in mind, uh, looking at your questionnaire, you've stated on the B section in the middle, page 12, that given a choice of support or oppose the death penalty, you indicated you support it. Is that still the way you feel? Yes. Okay. And then just given a choice of selections about what accurately represents the way you feel uh, on page 13, you circled 
paragraph C, which reads, quote, I generally favor the death penalty, but I would base a decision to impose it on the facts, law, and instructions of the case, end quote. Is that still, you think, the accurate representation of your thoughts on the death penalty? Yes. Okay, where you've indicated you would follow the instructions if required to do that. Um, one other question I'll have for you then. Would you, um, pardon me, would you be in favor of the death penalty on every case where a murder has been committed? It depends on the case. Okay, so if the instructions were there that you were to consider it, you would be able to consider it. If you were not instructed to consider it or instructed not to consider it, would you be willing to follow those as well? Okay, that concludes the court's for dire of this juror as it relates to the death penalty. Is the state wishing to have any more dire on that issue? All right, from the defense, any questions? Just a few. Sir, so I'm, I'm looking at your questionnaire and it's on top of page 14. Could you refer to that for me? And, and I'll read that as best I can. If you were in favor of the death penalty in some cases, do you agree that a sentence of life in prison rather than the death penalty would be appropriate under proper circumstances in some cases? And you marked the word no. So I guess I, 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 I'm just, and this is not a quiz or anything else. Obviously, I think we spoke earlier and I mentioned that there's no right or wrong answer. It's what each of us personally believe in our hearts. And that's what we were trying to arrive at here. What are your personal beliefs? And what are those beliefs? 16 or 20 people, everybody has different beliefs. But there's no right or wrong. You get to say what your beliefs are and, 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 and let us know so we can do an assessment of where we think whether you're thinking or not. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, so when it says that um, you would not consider life in prison as an option, if the if for some reason, and this isn't to apply to Mr. Davis, who we found guilty. But if we are in front of a, and the jury uh, makes a decision that it's a guilty verdict, and the court gives you a life sentence as an option, and the death penalty as an option, and you two are, you are have to decide which of those two you're going to choose. The way I'm reading number seven there is that you will always choose the death penalty. I didn't interpret that question that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so is it fair to say then that under certain circumstances you would not impose it? Yes, it depends on the circumstances. Yes, okay. When you're looking at those items, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G, that would be on page 13. Did you go to 13 for me? Do you mind? Let me know what you think. Um, you marked number C. And then right below it is number D. And the only difference between C and D is C says I'm generally favoring the death penalty, and D says I'm generally opposed. But both of those say I'm going to consider other options. Would you agree with that? With that, that both are relatively close with the exception. One says generally opposed, one says generally agree. Am I confusing you? A little bit. Okay, sorry. In looking at those, you mark number C, and then right below that is number D. Do you see number D? Yes. And it's basically the same writing in D, except the first part says generally opposed. You see how that's written? Okay. Would it be fair to say that you're between the generally opposed and generally uh, agreeable and that you're more neutral on this and you're going to take the time to look at the facts of the case 
and make a determination how you're going to vote based on the facts of each individual case. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not necessarily saying you're not opposed to it, but when given that opportunity, if that should happen, you're going to weigh both of those equally, aren't you? Yeah. And you're not going to rule one way or the other until you have all of the facts and make an informed decision of which way you're going to go. Would that be fair? That would be fair. Okay. Is that how you would feel in this situation? And you would be neutral and weigh the facts one way or the other before you make that final decision? Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that, is that how you feel? Or do you feel that you really just agree with the death penalty and then that's where I tend to where I tend to be wanting to lean? I guess that's what I'm trying to make establish here. I would say I'm not opposed to the death penalty. It's on the table and you know if I feel it's needed, then that's the way I'm going to do. Okay. So yeah. you're gonna look at both circumstances then. Yeah. Okay. And Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh Turn number 631, then that will conclude the individual for Dyer. Have you returned to the jury room? Thank you for your patience. I know it's been a long day for you today. We'll have you instructed to further as soon as we can. We've got a few more to get through, and then we'll call you back into the courtroom shortly. Your 647. All right, juror 647, thank you for returning. We're going to conduct some additional board dire here. The court wanted to first address issues of potential bias. Um, I don't believe there were any concerns regarding hardship. Counsel, the court did offer a special instruction, and I would note that uh, this juror has some specific knowledge of the companion case. And so perhaps those are appropriate lines of questions here, too. Uh, I am going to let the state first inquire as to whether or not it would be a bias to be considered, and then I'll let the defense proceed after that. So who's conducting board diagram for the state? All right, Ms. Beatty, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, just a few quick questions. I saw that you uh, had seen a little bit about this case on the news. Uh, and I, I want to specifically talk about um, on page 15, how you indicated that you had seen on the news uh, that Lori Vallow was recently found guilty and sentenced uh, in her case. Knowing that, uh, would you be able to take Mr. Daybell, the defendant, and give him a clean slate and a presumption of innocence for going into this case? Yes, and be fair and impartial. Okay. And there's nothing else that you saw about this case that would influence your decision-making process in any way. And just if you understand that what you've seen on the news or heard on TV or social media is not evidence. Correct. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. No questions, Judge. 
All right. The next topic then the court will address a future 647 relates to responses you provided on the questionnaire starting on page 12. And this is on the topic of attitudes regarding the death penalty. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those in the questionnaire? Yes. And are the answers you provided still true and accurate in the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes. All right, as I previously stated in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember, any penalty you consider should be done as if it is absolute and will be carried out in the case. So considering that then um, you were posed a question about the supporter opposed the death penalty and to summarize you said it's more complicated than that for me is that a good summary of how you answer you question mark both of those options yes because i don't think i actually have a strong opinion and um i know when i got maybe over to page 13 and just talking about that there is law and there is rule i don't know those and i'm not familiar with it so that is something that um kind of swayed my support or oppose, I would need to have more information. Okay. To grasp that, like understanding the process. You stated in your questionnaire that your views on the death penalty would not prevent you from being impartial in this case and viewing the facts impartially. Do you still feel that way? I do feel that way. You've also stated that your views on the death penalty would not prevent you from the ability to return a guilty verdict of first degree murder if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you still feel that way? Uh, yep, I still feel the same way. All right, on page 13, you did circle D out of the choices there to say what most accurately represents how you feel. You said uh, the choice you made, not your words, but in the questionnaire. I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if called for by the facts, law, and instructions in the case. Um, you added some additional language on that, but is that still the way you feel at this time? Um, given those choices that I was given, yes, that was the one that I would say would be closest to my alignment. Okay, so to be clear, if the court did instruct you that in this particular case you were to consider it, you're telling me that would not impact your ability to return a verdict, is that correct? Correct. And if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you would be able to return a guilty verdict, is that correct? Correct. And likewise, uh, you would be also willing to fully follow any instructions the court gave you, even if it required you to consider the death penalty. Is that accurately how you feel? Yes, correct. All right, that will conclude the court's inquiry on for Dyer for this topic. I'll let the state proceed if they have any questions. And Your Honor, I don't have any additional questions. Thank All right, thank you, Ms. Bailey. No questions, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, juror number 647, then that concludes your individual for Dyer. Thank you for your candid responses today. We'll go ahead and have you return to the jury room while we go through our remaining jurors and call you back as soon as we can. Okay, Thanks for thank your you. patience. Juror number 653 will be next. All right, juror 653, thank you for returning for some additional board questioning. Uh, there's a bit of 
previous case knowledge you do have in addition there was a concern of hardship let me first ask you some additional questions about the potential hardship here um, you did fill out on your questionnaire and you said it could be a financial hardship given 10 weeks and no paycheck is that still the position you're at currently no that was before my employer told me that i was covered okay thank you so much for clarifying that Given that, then, do you have any concerns about a hardship if you are required to serve in this case? Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, then, let's have this for Dyer limited to any questions on potential bias with some case knowledge. And then we'll move on to the next topic if we get through there, beginning with the state. Your Honor, the state doesn't have any questions as to a bias or case knowledge that comes with arbitrary. Okay. No questions, Judge. All right. Um, so, juror number 653, then the next topic we would discuss is it in relation to your answers about your attitudes regarding the death penalty? Mm -hmm. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those questions on that topic? It starts on page 12 in the questionnaire if you want to refer to your copy. Yeah, okay. okay, are the answers you provided in that section of the questionnaire still true and accurate? Yes, it is. And that's the way you feel as you sit here today? Yes, it is. You indicated that you would support the death penalty and say you agree it's appropriate under Idaho law. Is that correct? If it's appropriate, yeah. All right. And on page 13, you were given some options about what best represents how you feel. Um, you circled D, and D says, I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts, law, and instructions in the case. So do you believe that accurately represents your feelings about the topic? As far as all of the choices were, that was the closest, I guess. I'm not one, I'm not just straight like, all for it and I'm not straight against it. It's just okay. In this case, I will advise you that it may be necessary for you to in fact make a determination here on the topic of death penalty and make a decision in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And you need to consider that as if it would be done and would be absolute and carried out in the case. So knowing that then where you've indicated maybe some opposition to it, would you be willing to follow the court's instructions in this case, even as it relates to any instructions on the death penalty? Correct. Okay, is there anything about your personal views or opinions or beliefs which would make you be unable to or unwilling to follow any jury instructions provided to you? No, not at all. Do you have a feeling that or a belief that it would be appropriate for the death penalty to be imposed in every case where a murder has been committed. Yeah. Okay, so you'd be willing to consider each case independently based on a court's instruction. Independently on the facts of the case. All right, that will conclude the court's inquiry as it relates to this juror. Does the state have any questions for juror 653 on that issue? We have no questions, Your Honor. No questions, Your Honor. Okay, thank you for returning, juror 653. We'll have you go back to the jury room and we should be getting to you pretty quick here to release you for the evening. We'll next bring in juror 686. <laughs>
All right, welcome back to number 686. This is the time we have for some individual questioning. Um, I'd note that you didn't indicate any previous knowledge of the case. So in terms of bias, will the, I'll just inquire of the state. Will the state is any further for dire on bias? Your Honor, I have no questions regarding um, bias or hardship. All right. I don't need to judge. Okay, um, I've actually got one I do want to follow up on, on on hardship, just to be clear here, juror 686. So you said the length of the trial wouldn't be a problem. Uh, you did make one comment on page 20, um, and you said that with the court's trial schedule of finishing each day at 3.30, it said that time would allow me to continue to fulfill work obligations. So I wanted to sort of clarify what may be happening here. Is it your uh, proposal to us or yourself that would you believe you're going to be working full time or maintaining whatever current job you have while this trial is, is going for those 10 weeks? Uh, not full time, uh, part time. I'm a resident for my clinic. And so I would either need to um, contact the residency or and by a company and kind of let them know that I'm going to be completely off for 10 weeks or work, you know, a few hours um, every day just to kind of maintain my residency position. Okay. The reason I bring that up is I believe you may find between the time to get here leave and listen to trial through a day that might, uh, you might be mentally exhausted and done working. So I just want to dispel any uh, sense that maybe somebody could have work full-time and do this full-time, I think it'd be very difficult. Um, so I appreciate your response. The court raised that. Any further questions on his work obligations from the state? I guess just briefly, with that additional information, does anything about that in your mind impact your ability to sit on a jury in this matter? No, if I'm here, I'm committed. Thank you. I have no additional questions. Okay. No questions, Judge. Thank you. All right. The next topic then we'll get to uh, is on your attitudes regarding the death penalty. That was addressed in the questionnaire starting on page 12. Do you recall reading through those questions and answering those questions? I do. As you sit here today, do you think your responses are still accurate in the way you feel? I do. All right, let me just advise you uh, that in this case, it may be necessary for you to make a determination in regard to the imposition of the death penalty or some other penalty. And remember, any penalty you consider should be considered as if it is absolute and will be carried out in this case. So with that in mind, I'll note you had a choice first on page 12 on the question, do you support or oppose the death penalty? You said you support the death penalty. Is that still your position here today? It is. You next stated you didn't think any opinion you held on that would prevent you from being an impartial juror. Is that still the way you feel? Correct. And do you believe you'd be able to follow all of the court's instructions relating to the death penalty if they were provided in this case? I do. All right, on your selections on page 13, where we gave you some options about what most accurately represents the way you feel, you selected choice D that said, I am generally opposed to the death penalty, but I believe I can put aside my feelings against the death penalty and impose it if it is called for by the facts law and instructions in the case. Is that the way you feel about it? Yes. Okay, so with that general opposition, um, I'll just ask you to cover this. You would, does that mean you're not in favor of the death penalty in every case? Um, so I guess to clarify, I support the death penalty as an option. I personally feel that um, I generally oppose it just because I feel that death might be considered an easy way out for some people. And so part of that goes along um, with our argument against it, which is a life imprisonment in a small cell would be, I consider, a far worse punishment than killing someone. Okay. 
given all of your thoughts on this then and your responses, is it correct for me to say that you would be willing to follow any court's instructions, even if it required you to consider the death penalty on proof of evidence by the state? Yes. All right, that will conclude the court's for dire on that topic for this juror 686. Does the state have any questions? The state does not have any additional questions. All right, thank you from the no defense. Questions. Okay, juror 686. Thank you for returning for individual voir dire. We're going to talk to one more juror individually and then we'll bring you back in. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Our final juror of this group will be juror 740. All right, Juror 740, thank you for returning. We've got some additional individual questions for you. Do you recall filling out and completing the questionnaire last week? Yes. And is everything you provided in there still true and accurate as well as you remember? Yes. Okay, Council, there are some indications here both of a potential hardship and also a knowledge of the case we need to discuss. Let me first uh, indicate you you said and we don't need to discuss terms you can if you would like you've got a medical procedure that would need to be rescheduled um, you did indicate you thought that would be a hardship if you were required to serve here for 10 weeks let me just confirm is it still the status as you mentioned in here that that procedure would have to be rescheduled yes and how can you just explain to me a little bit about how much of a hardship that would be or whether you just simply think that shouldn't be rescheduled? Uh, no, I don't think it'll be a hardship. I can just have it rescheduled until August or whatever. Okay, so it's an elective procedure and it's not on some critical time frame. No. Okay, that was my only question on that. Council, you can inquire further on any hardship. In addition, there is some case knowledge uh, starting with the state, if you'd like a question on bias, we'll begin there. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, juror 740, so it, reading over your question, it looks like you've, uh, you have followed this case fairly closely. Is that accurate? Yes. And uh, it, it looks like, and I'm not going to delve into it, but you know a lot of the facts, or at least the facts as reported by the media. Correct. And you're familiar with the defendant's uh, with his with his wife's case. Correct. And you mentioned um, did you did you follow that trial? Just from news reports. The news reports, okay. But you did keep it up with it. Yes. And is there, you have your, your questionnaire with you. Could you open it to page 19 and question 10D? Yes. And so is it is it fair, and I don't want to mischaracterize what you've said, but is it, is it fair to say that you feel as though the media has uh, trade this defendant as well? And 
He then go on to say you'd be able to put that out of your mind if you render an impartial verdict. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Um, understanding, uh, you understand that the state has the burden of proof, correct? And that this defendant has has the benefit of uh, the presumption. He is innocent until proven guilty. And so when you say, I think I can, and, and there's not a wrong answer. There's nothing wrong with your answer, just, just to be clear. Um, can you understand how both the state and the defendant might be concerned if that's not an unqualified yes, I can set it aside? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I did want to ask another question, maybe related to bias. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details of it. It sounds like one of your siblings may have gotten into a little bit of trouble. Correct. Uh, would that affect how you view law enforcement or the court system in any way? I have a bias against how his court is <laughs> Okay. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, do you think, is it possible that that might uh, in, un, even unintentionally sink into how you view this case? It's possible, but I think it would seep in that innocent intent. Okay, so on, on the benefit of the defendant. Yes. Your Honor, uh, based on Juror 740's answer, they, they think they can, but without that unqualified um, ability to state that she can render an impartial verdict, the state would move to excuse uh, 740 for cause. Uh, response from the defense. Judge, I guess I, I think in that, that, that slightly unclear answer. She could or not, she's sure she's I'm sure she's trying to do her best, but sure she did that to stop the All right, there's been a motion to strike the cause 740 from the state, not opposed by the defense. Uh, the court is likewise concerned that too much knowledge and information about this case may have led to the shifting of the burden uh, against the presumption of innocence of the defendant. Again, it's nothing personal. Everybody's certainly entitled to follow the news. Many people do, and oftentimes draw opinions based on what they've seen. In this particular case, that would make it inappropriate for you to continue on as a juror. So if you have basically concluded your service as a juror in this case, thank you so much for taking the time you did to come in today, as well as filling out the questionnaire last week. You will be excused for cause, and please leave your copy of your questionnaire with the bailiff on your way out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bailiff, we'll have the remaining jurors return, please. Get their stuff brought back in your honor. Okay. Oh, 
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, if I correctly organized my stack here, uh, biggest number smallest, we should have returning here 0686, 653, 647, 631, 536, 526, and 505. Did I catch all of your numbers there? Is there anybody here that I didn't call their number? Okay. Um, thank you for returning then. At this time, I'm going to ask, beginning with the state here, will the state pass these remaining jurors for cause? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Does the defense pass this group for cause? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. I know it's been a long day for you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You have been passed for cause. We'll continue to question additional groups of jurors until we reach the necessary number we need to exercise peremptory challenges. You're going to receive additional instructions through our jury commissioner, Andy Rutland, who will advise you of when you will be required to return to find out if you are selected to serve in this case. While you are waiting for that to happen, please follow the court's previous admonishment not to do anything to uh, develop a bias in this case by investigating the case. Don't do any investigation of the case. Look into the case. Discuss your jury service with anyone other than to talk about uh, potentially ad arranging schedules to provide for your jury service. And I'll be asking you to complete an admonishment when you return that you have followed that instruction and not investigated the case. If anybody wants to talk to you about the case, don't allow them to. And if they persist, you can report that to the court. Uh, with that in mind, then, I believe this group of jurors can be excused awaiting further instructions on when you'll return. Anything else before we allow them to be released today from the state? No, Your Honor. Thank you. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay. If everyone, please rise. We'll let these jurors be excused. <laughs> Thank you. Please be seated. Council, we have another group lined up for tomorrow, nine o'clock, given uh, the schedule and where we went today. The good news is we did go through a lot of jurors and get some available for peremptory challenge. Uh, it took a while, and we still need to get through questionnaires to be releasing jurors that simply aren't going to be able to serve, so we don't have so many being held up. So my proposition is to do that group at nine and then work through some questionnaires and a few other additional matters the court needs to attend to. Um, does the state approve of that plan going forward for tomorrow's schedule? Yes, Your Honor. If I might inquire if the court happens to have an idea of how many groups you'd like us to have ready to do the questionnaires. Okay, I'll probably address that as an administrative matter off the record, and we can talk about that before we leave today. From the defense, are you okay with that plan, Mr. Pryor? Yes, I Okay, we'll take up that group tomorrow then. Uh, we'll go off the record at this point, and I'll talk to counsel about preparation for jury questionnaire reviews tomorrow. That will conclude the proceedings. Thanks, everyone, for complying with the court's administrative order for the courtroom. We'll be in recess.